Ready? Okay. Hey, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Patrick McNeil, and uh, I'm unregistered 436 on Twitter. I'm a solutions architect for Radware with uh, about 15 years of telecom experience, at least half of that in, in security. Uh, welcome to the phony pony. Freaks blaze the way. So I'm Owen on Twitter. I'm Linux blog. Uh, I started out doing development work. I've done a bit of DevOps, sysadmin stuff, um, but I decided I like kind of breaking stuff more than building it, so I moved into pen testing, red teaming, so that's me. So when we were planning on putting together a talk for DerbyCon, we figured we needed to come up with some sort of Derby-related uh, name, so we found that uh, uh, there was this horse racing term called a pony, and the pony is a pony that leads all the thoroughbreds to the line before the start of a race. And we thought there was a bit of a analogy there where the old school freaks were really the ones that led a lot of other phone enthusiasts to explore the phone system, and they were really the first hackers. So they coaxed people into exploring personal computers when they first started to come out, and eventually coaxed the phone company into fixing their problems. And we did some more research and found out that, hey, our title was actually a real thing. There's some other slang terms associated with phony pony, but uh, one obscure definition was actually uh, in 1904, this guy named Henry Hayes proposed putting fake ponies on the front of cars because the, the, the horses that were on the road at the same time as the automobiles were getting scared, so he figured this would be one way to not scare them by actually giving them a fake horse beside them to, to calm them down. So this theme was functional, um, but it wasn't very entertaining or fun. So while kind of checking out Louisville, Kentucky area, I stumbled across um, a little known fact to me at least of, I guess Louisville out on, what is it, Baxter Avenue makes 90% of this product sold in the US over the last 50 years. Anyone know what it is? It's like not something you would think of. <laughs> Tiny the scope bomb. Live here or something? Yeah. <laughs> So yeah, yeah. It was. It was. This it, is what uh, Dave's reaction was. <laughs> you missed the intro, man. Well, I missed the intro because I can't do keyboards. We we googled Dave Kennedy dancing, and this is what this is what Google came up with. You might, you might have to replay that again at the end. But he's a really good tap dancer, apparently. So what we're actually going to cover though is a little bit of brief history of phone systems, um, a little bit of evolution. We're going to go over attack and defense of each of those categories and give you a little bit of an update of a tool we've been working on. Um, and we've done some set integration, uh, which will be always up online now. You can go grab it. So first, the mandatory disclaimers. I'm not going to read you the bullets, but uh, yeah. This is our own views and opinions. We don't represent anybody else. All right, so before users uh, were actually allowed to dial phone numbers, they had to rely on operators. And the operators, you'd pick up the phone and you would tell them the exchange you wanted and the number that you wanted to be connected to. There were no buttons or dials or anything on the phone. So the operator uh, would make that connection for you. But user dialing, where we could actually dial our own numbers, came from a fairly unlikely source. There was a guy named Al Stroger who was an undertaker. And he felt that his business was being stolen because it suddenly kind of went down. And he found out that uh, one of his competitors' wives was actually an operator. So he figured, well, maybe she's the one who's routing calls over when somebody says, I need the undertaker, to his competitor. So being an inventive kind of guy, he came up with his own uh, switching mechanism, something called the Stroger switch. And it used alternating current pulses to rotate a dial. And at the time, his exchange had a three-digit uh, uh, three uh, number. So he came up with three separate rotary switches. And there was one for the hundreds place, one for the tens place, and one for the ones place. And there were three buttons. You had to press the individual buttons repeatedly 
So if you're extension 987, it was nine times and eight times, and so it's a very cumbersome. Hard, it was very cumbersome to dial. So, but it, it worked, and he eventually ended up selling that to uh, Belcor. So they came out with a, an alternate version of it, and as implemented by them, they included the rotary dial that we were familiar with. However, in order to take operators out of the equation completely, so you could get beyond one exchange to another, they had to have a mechanism for you to replace that name of the exchange with a number. And that's how they ended up developing the uh, alphanumeric scheme that we know of now, where you have the A, B, C, D, E, F on the actual digits. They abbreviated the exchange names, and then you would dial the abbreviation for that exchange using the numbers that it mapped to. So nothing changes without a motivating event. And you know, AT&T not only uh, wanted to you know, make it easier for users to dial, but they wanted to save money. So their motivation was to create efficiencies in their growing network, but also to limit the size of their workforce. So uh, the panel and crossbar electronic switching system was really the first example of uh, the switching system that they developed to replace operators and not have to tie up as many stroker switches. So they were allowed, or they were able to build up the numbers that were dialed in something called a sender and then send that to the switch, which would then signal to the network, you know, what connection to make, and you didn't need all the stroker switches. That, that covered you know, local and, and inter-exchange dialing, but it didn't handle long distance. So they eventually developed the, uh, the 4A that used metal cards. And the metal cards represented routes from one exchange to another, and they had backup routes. So um, if one route didn't work out, they'd, they'd pick the next one. That finally took operators out of the equation for you know, long distance dialing. And they had to adapt, similar to the exchange to exchange dialing, they had to adapt the dialing scheme so that you could go from you know, one city to the next. And that's how they, we ended up with the three-digit area codes. Now, what they hadn't intended was their fatal flaw. If you're trying to use electrical pulses to signal, those electrical pulses can't go all the way across the country, right? So they introduced a multi free or at first it was a single frequency and then later a multi frequency tone that signaled from switch to switch and unfortunately through listening to the connections that were made when when they would dial freaks figured out that if they used a 2600 tone which was the supervisory tone they could trick the switch into thinking that they had hung up and then they could actually signal the digits that they wanted to dial. So from the perspective of the phone company, uh, you know, they, the call was torn down, and this new call that was coming in was not billable. So we get onto the future of VoIP, because you know, we've got to take a look into the future. Um, what could happen? It's, it's a pretty safe statement to say SIP is, is around to stay. Um, it's not going to go anywhere. There's some cool stuff coming out, some good innovations, um, Envoy, Pep, WebRTC, and click to call are all upcoming. Um, maybe as we see systems getting stronger, we'll see more people using voice or, or calls like, you know, the, the whole Google, we're going to call you and give you a pin for your one-time password. We, we ain't got a disco ball. We, we don't know, into the, can't look into the future too much. So, yeah, we're not going to show you any elite ODs or anything. Um, we will cover some attack vectors that are still effective and need to be defended against. And we'll show a simple, the simple vector, which is Freak Me Tool, um, that we thought of at CarolinaCon, um, and we've been working on a bit. So we'll talk about asterisk for a bit, because I'm, I'm sure you're all familiar with asterisk, or a lot of you are. Get some feedback. Um, but it's created in 99. I'm not going to read the slides. Uh, it's got a ton of books, ton of information out there. The two interesting things are AMI and AGI. AMI is the asterisk management interface, and the AGI is the gateway interface, which is kind of like your CGI of asterisk. It does everything some, in some way or another. It may not do it well, but you can do some really cool stuff with the AGI, like handle calls, make calls, 
log to a database. So. Built upon that, you have all of these uh, custom distributions that are built on top of it. Um, I'm not going to read those, but you know, when you're building something on top of something to make it easier and you're not doing code audits or making it good or just ch setting permissions, running everything as root, you know, it's not always going to be secure. So eventually you, you might break your disco ball. You, know, you might get shoot it down or something. But yeah, so we're going to attack bus defense. Yeah, so we're, we're going to cover some threats um, at a high level go over attack, but I, I also wanted to introduce a measure of defense because it seems like many of the talks at these types of conferences are always how you can compromise things and not necessarily defend them. Uh, so we're going to cover some some threats, but certainly not everything because we could be up here basically all evening covering VoIP threats. All right, so the first one is information leakage, and we're going to give you a, a perspective of the freaks in history versus today. Um, obviously, you know, using a system for something it wasn't designed for, uh, you know, stuff that reveals the usage or location or, you know, how to access the system. Information you may not want somebody else to have. Yeah. So the, the freaks, um, th there was all kinds of information available to them because people hadn't really considered security when the phone system was designed. Um, you know, freaks were the first real enthusiasts, and they liked to explore the phone system, not necessarily nefariously, and they took advantage of information leakage all over. Um, some of them would social engineer operators into connecting calls for them, mostly the, uh, the operators that were called inward operators. They were the ones that made the long distance calls. Some of them would uh, uh, ask their girlfriends to impersonate an operator and call another operator, because at the time, operators were pretty much all women. Uh, it, the phone company had tried to use teenage boys and found that that sort of backfired because teenage boys surprisingly had attitudes when connecting customers. And women, you know, if you could get a girlfriend to do it for you, they were more believable. Uh, they also talked to phone technicians because they were the only phone system around and phone techs were really proud to work for that company. So they'd say, hey man, how does this thing work? And when you do this, what happens? And so they they dish and give them information. And then, of course, the in-band clicks and tones were there for anybody to listen to. So you could hear click, click, click and different, you know, different beeps and stuff. And you still hear those today. But What's that? You still hear those you, today. Yeah, you hear some of them today, but what we know is the multi-frequency tones on, on your actual dial tone now are different than what yeah. were used to signal between exchanges. But, but they kind so, of tore that down, reverse engineered it. And yeah, exactly. So, so people use tape recorders, you know, they'd actually tape that and they'd splice the tape together and replay it or just listen to it and figure out how to do it with a tone generator. And that's basically the evolution of the first blue box. It was just a tone generator. So they could generate the 2600 tone and then send the single or multi-frequency tones down the line to, to dial the next number they wanted. The, we don't really know of any defining moment when there was like the first guy who figured it out because there are all kinds of different stories of people figuring out about the same time, and it was much earlier than many of us think. It was, you know, back in the, the like, 53, 54 uh, time frame. And really one of the first test cases of this was uh, Charlie Pine, Tony Lauk, and Ed Ross at uh, uh, MIT, MIT and Harvard. Was and that? MIT and Harvard. Yeah. Okay. They, I don't know how they, they met up. Uh, but apparently they did. The, the Harvard guys were involved in the radio station, and the MIT guy was an electronics engineer and went, well, instead of splicing that tape together, I can build you a box that'll do the same thing. And it, you know, he came up with the first tone generator. But they became noticed because they were war dialing, essentially, and they dialed an Air Force base. So Air Force base calls the FBI, AT&T gets involved. They're thinking they're spies, and they're detained, and they find out they're just making phone calls for fun. And um, the FBI had no choice but to let them go. They figured out they're not spies. There were no such thing as you know phone fraud charges back then. And there was no law against it. And so the phone company eventually gave freaks even more information and gave them a big gift, which was the 1960 issue of the Bell System Technical Journal. It's pictured there. And you know, they were proud of their own accomplishments, so essentially they published the exact uh, 
multi-frequency tones that were used to sing from one exchange to the other to signal calls. So they basically, basically gave them the plans for a blue box. Hey, if you're going to signal calls from a tone generator, this is exactly the frequency you need to do it at instead of trying to figure it out. So freaks also dialed exhaustively. Besides just dialing phone numbers to find interesting numbers, they did unusual prefixes and found different routing codes and basically ways to uh, force calls to route in the directions that they wanted them to. Uh, one of those numbers or number types they found was called a loop round. And essentially it was a diagnostic tool that a guy in the field could use uh, to connect one line to another. But they figured out that these were free to dial and you could get two people together without paying for that call if you dialed a, uh, you know, you each dialed the number. It was like a one-on-one -on -one call, like a, a small scale party line. Um, and then eventually there were underground papers that were published that had the plans for blue boxes essentially to stick it to the man, AT&T and the federal government because we had a, a federally subsidized telco at that point. Um, you know, make free phone calls. Now, the, the wider world was never really aware of phone freaking until 1971, and this Esquire article came out called Secrets of the Little Blue Box. And essentially, um, it introduced the world to the, these guys, Joe Ingressia, Mark Bernay, and John Draper. And, um, you know, they certainly weren't the phone, first phone freaks, but they became uh, some of the more well-noted ones. And, you know, the, the phone company started to respond to the blue boxing uh, that was going on by introducing an out-of-band signaling method. So they essentially put modems in that would signal from one exchange to the other. So it was uh, uh, what was called common channel interoffice signaling. So essentially, once they started rolling this out, blue boxing started to go downhill, and the freaks, you know, could still blue box from from some exchanges, but not all of them. And they started looking for other things to mess around with. So some freaks started transitioning to BBSs, and you know, hey, if the modems can be used to connect offices, we can use them to connect to other computers. Personal computers came out, and it was just a natural <coughs> transition. So many freaks became the first hackers. Um, from, a, from a history perspective, this is like barely scratching the surface. So I definitely recommend Exploding the Phone by Phil Lapsley. All right, so from a, from a nowadays perspective, you know, it's just as easy, if not easier, to get information about the phone system um, because a lot of people are connecting asterisk boxes and enterprise systems. You can get one of these on the gray market. You can download a virtual machine of asterisk and start messing around with it. Uh, you can scan the internet and find them. Uh, certainly, if you've got your own, port scan it and see what's open, what's common in that release. Do SIP stack in OS fingerprinting. You can figure out what proprietary headers they're using. Uh, extension enumeration, where you're rolling through a quick test message to multiple extensions to figure out which ones are actually there to be cracked. And just listening to voicemail prompts, like, okay, that's the default Digium recording for, you know, a voicemail prompt. So you can kind of, kind of profile. I'll figure the, that out from system. that. Yep. So SIP is a lot like HTTP, if anyone's familiar with that. I mean, this is, like we said, it's the most common VoIP protocol. You go ahead. Yeah, it's, it's the, the signaling component that establishes calls. And then the part in blue is, uh, session description protocol. It's what negotiates the real-time protocol or the bearer path, the audio or video that's going to be sent as part of what was signaled by SIP. Um, and of course, because it's text-based, just like HTTP, you can man in the middle of this and, and mess around with it at will, assuming you can get a man in the middle position. And of course, SIP authentication is still using this old dead uh, MD5 authentication mechanism. So it's, it's been somewhat secured by the use of TLS and SRTP, but you know, encryption's hard, so there's not a whole lot of people that have actually deployed TLS and SRTP even for public calls over the internet, or they've done it sort of halfway, 
yeah, they've got TLS, but no SDP, so it's still not secure, or they're still doing server-side authentication only and not deploying client-side certificates. So, hey, that's great, but certificate not, not really adding much security-wise. Yeah, certificate management's hard. We don't want to do that. So, from the uh, from the aggressor side, if you're going to you know go after somebody, a lot of this is all basic stuff. You're doing a pen test. Do the Google searches first. Look at job words. Uh, call the company and roll the voicemail and identify what they're running from their their prompts. If they're internet connected, send them a quick SIP options message if you can find their their call server and uh, maybe if that doesn't work, an invite message and see what the SIP headers are that come back because a lot of vendors have proprietary headers, so you can identify. Oh, that's an Avaya call manager, you know, 11.3, blah, blah, blah. So now you know exactly what to look up for exploits. Uh, enumerating user extensions, you're just sending an invite to every possible number that, that you think might be on their, their, uh, their system. And in many cases, the website will show you the five digit or four digit extensions of all the employees there. So you already know, okay, they're using a four or five digit scheme, just that's a real quick scan. Um, and of course, like I said, once you know what they're running, a quick bone database scan. Yeah, good. Thanks, Juan. Nice. Um, from an information gathering perspective, you know, port scans definitely, but obviously run them slow, and you have to specify manually the port ranges to pick up stuff like AGI, Nmap at least by default, because like, who doesn't use Nmap, right? Right, does, with AMI, yeah, like AGI run. Yeah. Doesn't, doesn't pick up AMI or AGI. Um, there, there's a bunch of SIP scanning tools as well on uh, uh, Backtrack and Kali, but some of them, you know, there's already signatures for them. So if you're using the default tool, they're going to get nailed right away. So you have to go in and change stuff like user agent values, use multiple tools to, to maybe catch somebody who's got a signature for one but not the other. Uh, scan with alternate SIP methods. Most of the tools will use an options method, but you can tweak it to use invite or cancel or something else to get them to actually show that they're there because options messages are, are filtered out. Um, the Metasploit scanner is actually pretty good. It won't help you with credential cracking uh, as much, but the Metasploit scanner randomizes every single field in the, in the, the messages, so you can't necessarily build a signature for it. Um, and I, I'm a big supporter for both Viproy and Blue Box NG. Uh, know the creators, and they're they're both actively maintained tools. So definitely check those two out. Yeah. So as an exercise, actually, you did all the work on this. You um, took the ZMAP data, so you did some good analysis. Yeah, of that. I, I corresponded with a, a Twitter acquaintance, Daniel Abreu in Australia, and and he helped me with the. Uh, Elasticsearch import of all the data and went through some queries and stuff. It, for the most part, we found what we expected, a whole bunch of Astro systems out there, um, lots of old and insecure MTAs and crap that could be, you know, busted really, really easily. The stuff that totally blew my mind was an actual DMS 100, which, if anybody's familiar, that's like a big iron telco switch up to like 1.2 million lines. Um, I think that one was in like Brazil or something, but uh, you know that and a lot of Huawei in Iran and a lot of cameras in China it was crazy. So from a defense perspective, I think it's fun to change your SIP user agent because every PBX on the planet seems like will return the user agent value that says I'm an asterisk or I'm an Avaya session manager, you know, six point whatever, you can change that. So you report something that's totally different, you know, different software release, and now your attackers are going to be maybe slightly stymied. They're going to be maybe. looking at something else. Maybe. Yeah, maybe, maybe not. If they really know what they're doing, not. Um, block bad user agents and use rate limiting. We, we have uh, IP tables on our GitHub that actually has a whole uh, plethora of bad known user agents that I collected over uh, close to three years of SIP honeypot research. Um, add your auth always reject to your asterisk config. So basically, if somebody's trying to enumerate what extensions are available, they're going to get the same error response as if they send an invalid password. 
So they're always going to get the same error message. They don't know if the extension's legit or not, whether they authenticate it or not, so it's hard to tell what's going on. Um, definitely using fail to ban to catch scanners. And uh, if you have the, the budget, you know, use a, use a security appliance that has specific signatures for SIP and we'll do all this for you so you don't necessarily have to mess with fail to ban. So we don't need, really need an explanation for exploitation, um, but basically exploiting something for selfish purposes or gain access to something else. Um, freaks used the weaknesses in the phone system for their advantage, you know, uh, they, they used it to enable further exploration. Um, people think that they were malicious, uh, but most of them were sure, probably, probably innocent, right? Yeah, maybe, I don't know, I wasn't there. Nowadays, you know, it's like the wild, wild west. Anybody's going to exploit anything if they can. Whatever we can, you know, fraud, DDoS, botnets, depends what the exploit is. Um, we can insert some more buzzwords there if you want, but. APT. Uh, Trixbox is, we were talking about it a little bit earlier, immensely popular front end for asterisk. Um, you can download it, boot it up, have yourself a working PBX with some really good features. Um, and it's quality software, as you can tell, since it's five stars, last updated in 2013. Um, and there were close to like almost 4,000 of those that showed up at that release level? Yeah, that were actually the exposed data. like in front of that, because yeah. in the Zmaps, it's not including the ones that are behind it. But yeah, there's a ton of vulnerabilities for this. This is up just up to 2013. I guess they stopped counting, maybe. I, I don't know what happened. But there's pretty much something in every category. Um, We've got some demos of some of them. I didn't write these. Um, attack terrorists did. At least not the first couple. I yeah, and not the first couple. Uh, the the unauthentic unauthenticated XSS. We just pop up a pop up box with the cookie. It's nothing um, crazy there. It's just your standard XSS. Well, uh, I, I guess we should probably point out that like we've been talking about SIP and stuff, but the admin interfaces that he's covering, like a lot of these, we didn't correlate the the open web interface to how many had SIP interfaces open, but this is very, very common that a small business will set it up and this, the web interface right. is wide open. Yeah, but this one is unauthenticated, so you don't have to log in to do an XSS, which is cool. Um, you can use it to surf your malware or whatever. Uh, exploitation um, with the local file inclusion, it just so happens that they have a local file inclusion. This is authenticated, so you're going to have to be logged in as an admin. Um, I, can't, I don't remember which section of the of it was what, what kind of access you'd need, but you can go ahead and, you know, read files on the system. You can't read like proc FDE or PHP input, which is kind of a bummer, so you can't get remote execution from that. But you can read uh, just the way the web interface works. You can read slash etc slash asterisk, which has your SIP config, your extensions, all of that. Um, the AMP portal is a great one. That's got your database password. And you can read asterisk logs, which which is kind of cool. But uh, chaining. Yeah, that's pretty much everything. Um, remote code execution, there. we said you can't do it by PHP input or, or what's the other one, the uh, file descriptor proc, but you, they, it doesn't matter because there's this one. You can just do a remote code execution. We have a um, quick demo of that. So let's see, play. I mean, these these are all super simple. They're super simple to exploit and super simple to fix too. But I remove the shell on localhost and then copy the string and run it. Do do do. So there it is. Then we'll uh, go back to the browser. <laughs> And then back to the terminal because I forgot to start my netcat listener. And this is the um, Pentest Monkeys Python reverse shell. And there you're logged in. Who am I? A masterisk. All right, so that was cool. Um, but even if those others didn't exist and it was just the LFI, um, we can inject a SIP message with a payload in it and then use the LFI to read the asterisk logs 
So we got a, a demo of that too. Now let's play that. Did it not play? It didn't play. Is it playing? Have to press space bar. <laughs> so there's your local file inclusion where <coughs> read the etc password and change it to something benign, make sure it's still working. For whatever reason, I do that. <laughs> and then you see that this is still working. We're going to read the asterisk logs. Which is super cool just to be able to read somebody else's asterisk logs. And then we send a test message with a tool called SIPSAC. And just test. And you can guess it shows up. So, what happens if you throw some PHP code in there? I already, here's one I prepared earlier. <laughs> just put PHP info in there. And there it is. So yeah, you could inject any malicious code you wanted. So that's cool. So you can use it as you wish. So don't check your asterisk logs, yeah. I guess, right? <laughs> yeah, that's why people try and just randomly inject random stuff into any log they can because you could potentially exploit something in the off chance you open it with Notepad or something. So uh, this one, that's, that's cool, but those are still authenticated. So this one is one that I chained all three of those together, or the XSS unauthenticated and the remote code execution, so two of them. And it gets kind of, the payload's kind of longer, it base64 encodes um, and redirects a window location. And so basically you'd want to send this fish to an administrator or somebody who has access if they, if they did some kind of ACL or something, said, okay, only allow people in, in my local network to admin my, my um, tricks box. You could use that. Just send it to them. We'll put it in an iframe. And it, it's still pretty confusing. It's going along, but we got an unauthenticated tab. And I have to press play. So this is the uh, payload. This took forever to get it working properly for something so simple. But it, it replaces the window location with the reverse shell we showed earlier. So that's showing that your this is an unauthenticated session. Those are the files. Now, that's good to mention that's the server. So, here's a logged in session. And you s it just clicks super important info. I'll do it again just to, just to see what's going on. And that is your shell. So, that we, we put it in the um, root so that you could get to it unauthenticated just because it doesn't make sense to write your shell but then have to authenticate to get to it. So that's nice. So how so do you defend so you against it? your admin into, put, into yeah. placing an unauthenticated Un shell yeah. for it. Yeah, just give me, put a shell right there. Um, exploitation defense, like I said, this isn't the best way of doing it, in Smarty at least, but this is one way of doing it. Just sanitize your input. if. For all three of those, it's one fix. Uh, let's see. So defending against everything as a whole is, is kind of difficult. It's, it's hard. Um, you're going to want to use some common sense. So I'd avoid the all-in-one distributions. Just They're so convenient, but they're also such a pain because you. I think one of them, you can't even update it because it just breaks all the dependencies. So you're stuck running an old yeah, version. Especially the tricks box because a lot of these are deployed on like uh, purpose-built appliances and they sell them to small businesses and if you are a small business owner do you really have the expertise to go upgrade that and if you do then you break dependencies and it's you know it's a support nightmare it's just easier so they to don't upgrade easier, easier to build it yourself um, don't build what you don't need and you you won't have to configure it and same with configuration if you've run across something that you don't know what it is don't know what it's need you'll be good you don't need it so uh, use a firewall, um, use fail to blend to kind of uh, block bad people. Um, but yeah, it's things, they have things like remote root for SSH and remote MySQL. You, you don't need that. 
So you have fraud and abuse. All right. Yeah. So the next category, fraud and abuse, basically using a service with no intention to pay, causing loss or damage, uh, you know, generally enabling criminals to make a profit. And maybe in some cases, you know, manipulation of the telephone network to do something unintended for fun. It's still fraud, but, you know. So the, the most common scheme for telephony fraud today is international revenue sharing fraud. There's a fraud market, according to the Communications Fraud Control Association's report in like 2013, which is the most current one I know of today, it's an $80 billion industry. And the FBI actually added a couple of fraudsters to their top 10 cyber most wanted. Um, essentially, you take over a PBX and you pump a bunch of traffic and you split the profit with somebody in a foreign country. Usually that country has uh, loose or no affiliation with US law enforcement. So it's pretty easy to make money and nobody's gonna come after you. Um, your PBX can be used to make calls or even forward incoming calls. And in many cases, you'll see stuff like a voicemail system that's compromised beyond just the PBX, and then uh, you know it forwards calls to high cost destinations. Um, uh, I guess the next one would be caller ID spoofing, maybe more of a social engineering vector, but you can also use it to bypass uh, some voicemail authentication. But uh, we'll get into that a little bit more on the next slide or two. Uh, telephony denial of service is another vector that's been growing where you're basically making legitimate calls uh, towards a target. Usually somebody's uh, running a scheme like extortion or maybe a uh, protest or a prank, but you'll call somebody up and say, we're, unless you give us this money, we're going to take your phone down. And, they just and the threshold could calls. be so low. It could be like, if you give it, don't give us $50, we're going to call you for the next hour and you're going to lose so much money. And, and vishing has definitely increased over the last uh, couple years, at least from my perspective anyways. There's a lot of robo-dials going on. We're all familiar with the like Windows support calls that come in and the calls that you get at 2 in the morning, like, this is your credit card company. You, you've been a victim of fraud. Enter your credit card number now. And they're collecting that information. And it's all just automated. Yep. All right, so back spoofing. Uh, a lot of people talk about faking caller ID, and the, it's a bit of a misnomer. Uh, people are really referring to the name display in many cases. You can fake the, the number, that it, the from number, but you can't necessarily fake the name that's displayed because that is actually resolved using a database DIP by your phone company. So the person who's making the call isn't sending that name. It's resolved by your company. They make a dip out to a public database and retrieve that name, and then that's what they display. So if you own the number, you can submit the name that you want displayed. But in many cases, phone companies will say, well, show us some proof that that's really you. A photo ID, a doing business as, some sort of doc public documentation that they'll, they'll say, okay, yeah, we'll, we'll let you do that. But not everybody checks that. There are some providers that um, you can you can send. Well, I, I'm sorry, I sort of uh, skipped. So many providers um, will also say if you're making a call out on a SIP trunk, you also have to send only your DID number going out. So we know this is the number people call you on. That's the only number you're allowed to make calls from. There are some providers that will allow you to spoof that outgoing number. Or send so, anything you want for like a call center yeah, provider anything, or something. Yeah, it, 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 is, it is valid. It has valid uses for uh, an outsourced call center that makes calls on behalf of lots of people. Um, but we can have fun with that. And the, the Truth and Caller ID Act of 2009 basically says uh, it is illegal to spoof numbers if there is intent to harm. So in our case, we can have fun with it within certain parameters, but yeah, yeah, we have no intent to harm. And so to change your caller ID in asterisk, once you find found the provider that will let you do this, which could be tricky, maybe not, um, it's pretty easy. You can do it in probably more places than two, but these are two ways we use it. Uh, extensions.conf, this will set like your default caller ID outbound, and then um, caller ID in your call file, super simple. Just change it. Yeah. And... So as a quick demo of that, hey, look who's calling me. <laughs> uh, 
It just took yeah. going through the phone book or whitepages.com to find David Kennedy, punched in a couple numbers, and found one that worked. We thought about calling the hotel with that caller ID, but that <laughs> oh, may I be... I need to cancel my room. <laughs> yeah, all three or four of the conference rooms. <laughs> that might be um, malicious intent. So, <laughs> so we kind of, um, after Carolina Con, got this idea of... Um, like we were messing around and sitting at the table just sending random caller IDs. There were some interesting ones that went back and forth um, and seeing what phones resolved what, which IDs. Um, so I was like, well, what if you got a call from your voicemail? If you spoofed your voicemail or your carrier's voicemail number, would it show up voicemail? And it turns out it does. Or even your so, corporate voicemail number yeah. calling your cell phone or something. So we made, started working on a little project called Freak Me, which... Basically, a vishing tool now that runs on turnkey, Ast uh, turnkey Linux using Asterisk AGI. Um, th these are the uh, some of the other use cases we came up up with. Is as of the morning being acquired, or a new tech support fast track. Somebody suggested um, doing like a donation campaign or something. Yeah. Um, we noticed you haven't signed up for the corporate giving campaign. Yeah, please, please insert your credit card <laughs> or whatever. Um, so we, we made an IVR for it. You dial in and you can configure everything through it, IVR. Um, set up a cooler ID. You set up your targets. You select one of the recordings that you've previously uploaded. And then you go ahead and click exploit. And it will hang up and dial everybody on that list. So that's cool. Um, and in this case, it would... I think we set the cooler ID to voicemail for this one. So, so it's, it's kind of hard to hear that. So we turn the menus off. Menu. We've heard it too many times. Enter a 10 digit US phone number. Beep, beep, beep. If you record those tones, you're just going to get my burner phone, so have fun, but you're not getting it. To specify call or it, press 2. Press any other key to use a global lid. Hang them up. Yeah, it's really hard to hear yeah, that. It's, it it's kind of campy. You're like <laughs> setting this up using your phone. So you couldn't really set up a very large dialing campaign with that without going insane. So this is just the log files. Um, we actually made a reporting menu, uh, but we didn't get time to demo that. But yeah. you entered five ones. Yeah, and IBR is, is kind of interesting and old school and fun. But uh, uh, we had some discussion at DEF CON after we gave this talk and went to the Telefreaks party after. And of course, other phone enthusiasts are like, oh, but you could do this or that. So it's just unmanageable to do it all through dial and menus. So we took it a step further. Yeah, so I, I made a REST interface, RESTful interface with PHP Slim framework for, for whatever reason. I used PHP, but it um, sits on the same machine as the Asterisk server that you're running for the project. And basically, it controls everything that the IVR does, but makes it a lot easier. Um, like there's an example of how to exploit and with specifying your caller ID at the bottom. Um, it sets almost sets everything up. You're still going to want to put your SIP provider's number in there and your username and password for your trunk. Um, so, yeah. Once you find a provider, yeah. Yeah, once you find a provider. So, another brainwave was to make a set module um, to kind of bring it back to the social engineer toolkit and you put it in user share modules and it accesses the REST API, will configure stuff for you and then allow you to exploit. So basically you run it, press free for the third party modules and then and do that. So this this is online for the very first time today. Yeah, we're dropping this today. So basically here, start up the set toolkit, it, go into third party modules and then option one to uh, set up your server URL. That one won't work by the way if you try to hit it. Um, you can authenticate, use, search, use uh, HTTPS uh, if you want. Um, then we basically go in and look to see what targets we have set up. In this case, we had none, so we're entering in my burner phone. You don't even need to decode the beeps. You enter it right there. Exactly. So then we so look at yeah, our default familiar. spoof number setting. You can go in and change it for the entire dialing campaign who you want to impersonate. In this case, it was a disco number. And... Uh, Looked at the default recording for calls. These will all be posted on our GitHub, by the way, if you're having trouble following it. If you're familiar with set, though, it's it's pretty pretty easy to 
it's, to do this. It's all menu driven, and right now it's one number at a time typing in, but I've got plans to have it so you can import a CSV file for the whole dialing campaign. Um, so now it's making a call in the background to my burner phone, and I've answered the call, and I'm punching in uh, five ones. He just answered the call. And then we go to reporting, I'm assuming. Yeah. Let me bust out of there and go to reporting. And you can see a bunch of calls that were made and the digits that were collected, but the one at the bottom is the one that uh, it just got. So if you set up a ton of numbers, you could see the ones that came back with input and the ones that came back with nothing. Like these were just the ones that weren't answered even by voicemail or anything. So this is what the call looks like when it comes in. It's going to be really loud. Isn't oh it? yeah, that's going to be loud. I'm trying your functions in a different place. Password. <laughs> what you didn't hear is it said, please enter your password, but I couldn't get the speakerphone on fast enough. And it's the five ones. So it's not very thrilling, but you can see that the caller ID came in with the right number, and it actually was resolved to Disco because the Nexus 5, I think it was, was uh, Android 5.1 or something, actually tries to do some caller ID stuff. Yep. So, so that's cool. Um, we're going to do some stuff to kind of expand this, uh, mostly on the exploitation side. Um, the REST interface is going to actually be able to configure everything uh, from on the asterisk side, so you're going to be able to set your provider up through there so you don't have to edit asterisk conf configuration files. You're going to do multi-step prompts when you answer, so it's not just hanging up on you. Like, please enter your password. Sorry, you did that wrong. Please enter it again. That, um, that it might be a little tricky. Uh, but all of these features, different caller IDs for different numbers. If you find out a different provider, you need to use a different caller ID. Uh, you can do some better reporting. Uh, possibly a mobile app and a web app, so you don't have to use set. If you don't want to, you could do it any other way. The, the, we can show you a demo at the bar using our cell phones, actually, with yeah. the REST interface. We could. And you've got plans, or have actually made it easy to deploy. So the, the, the disco started, this is the corporate, <laughs> no, it is even joked. Create a, a vishing system, make phone system audit tool to test for users. Um, we're going to expand the REST API. I've been expanding it and added, it's not in, in, in GitHub yet, but added upload, file upload capability so you can get your recording and do it. Um, and I did a deployment uh, kind of upgrade with Vagrant. So if you install Vagrant and then VirtualBox and just type Vagrant up, it downloads everything from GitHub, installs it, which is yeah, pretty so that's cool. there today. You can download the Vagrant machine and do Vagrant up, and it'll completely configure asterisk, freak me, uh, the set, whole nine The yards. web server, yeah. And the only thing you need from there is a SIP trunk. And your IP so you can hit, to hit the REST interface. But there is not really good documentation. That should be, um, I should write <laughs> that's some. That's on good, the list. Yeah, that's on the list. I want to do some, some automatic documentation. But it's pretty easy to use from reading the source code. Yeah. So any ideas, comments, so contributions? We're, we're like totally running out of time. But why do we care about this? Because if we collect that information, now we got your voicemail pin, we can make calls, uh, we can collect things that uh, might be able to get us past, you know, uh, password challenges and things like that. Um, from a defense perspective, obviously educate your users that they shouldn't be punching in numbers for incoming calls that are asking for their voicemail pins. This should be painfully obvious, but using some of the caller ID spoofing, you can make it sort of look pretty real. Um, you know, implement stuff like credential cracking if you're connected to the internet, block international destinations, and be aware that there are many international destinations in the Caribbean that look like they're in the North American numbering plan. They look like a regular 10-digit number, but they're not. 10-10 uh, dial-around is missed by a lot of administrators on their dial plan that allows you to select an alternative long-distance carrier, and you can get burned by that. Uh, call forwarding should probably be disabled. It's really not needed very much anymore. Um, don't allow voicemail systems to dial out and hit the next one here quick. Um, talk to your provider. A lot of them have fraud protections, but if you don't sign up for them, even though it's you know it seems expensive, you're you're liable. You can generate as much as ninety thousand dollars a minute as a fraudster from one compromised PBX. 
very, very simple, very quick. Uh, put pins on long distance trunks, do stuff like actually implement TLS and SRTP correctly. And if you don't want to maintain certificates for every individual user, at least issue a single organizational certificate that you can put on every single phone that will allow for mutual authentication. And then if somebody tries to crack credentials, it's a lot more difficult to can't connect. Um, and implement a fraud system if you have the type of funding to do so. So. All right. That is it. Thank you very much. That's our GitHub. Yeah, I tried to hit play, man. <laughs>